Good morning, church. It is so great to be with you this morning. I hope that you are well. I hope that you are comfortable at home. And I'm really looking forward to sharing a message with you. I feel like every time I've been in front of the camera lately, I've been joking and being silly, which is good fun, but I'm gonna harness like slightly serious Nicole this morning. So I'm really excited and I think we're in for a great morning. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you so much, God, for uh, the way that we can do church. And I just pray over every home and I pray over every person and over every family that is watching and that is tuning in right now. And God, I ask that your presence would fill every home. Uh, I ask for your peace to be upon every family, every person. And God, I just thank you so much that you have given us your word to show us how to live, to show us how to live well. Uh, and God, as I share your word and as we open up your word this morning, I just really pray that it would, it would change us. I pray that we would have hearts to receive. I pray that we would have ears to hear and that we would allow our minds to be transformed. And so I just ask that you would have your way in me and through me uh, and that you would be at work in every single person. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So church, we are in our fruitful series right now. And Andy kicked things off for us last week and he spoke about outward fruit fruit, and he talked about being fruit bearers and good works. And if you missed that, then I encourage you to jump online and have a look uh, and catch up. And so this morning, I actually want to look at inward fruit. And one of the things that Andy said last week is he said that that good works only come from the spirit working inside of us. And that is so true. And so I've actually got a lot of scripture um, that I'm going to go through this morning. And so I want to encourage you, church, to be ready and to be excited, to have your Bibles, to have your pens and papers, um, to take notes. And I, like preparing this sermon, I learnt so much. And so I, I really sense that God wants us to teach, to teach us some things this morning. So we're going to jump straight in to Galatians, uh, and that'll be on the screen for you. Galatians 5, and we will start at verse 13. And Paul says this, he says, you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite to what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed, and there's a great word there, but, but when you are directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are really clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. Everyone say fruit. This kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Wow, so that is a really powerful passage of scripture and there is so much good stuff in there. And you know, I love, I love the word of God and I love the Bible because it doesn't matter who you are and it doesn't matter you know, what situation you're in or what season you're in, it is always relevant. It is always applicable for every person all the time. And this passage in Galatians, this is the standard for our lives. I mean, the whole Bible is a standard for our lives, but this passage in, in particular, this is a standard for how we actually live and conduct ourselves. And there's a few verses in this passage that I want to just pull out this morning and highlight. And the first one is this in verse 16, where Paul says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And I've got the Amplified um, version up there just because it explains it so well. And it says this in the Amplified, but I say, walk habitually in the Holy Spirit. Seek him and be responsive to his guidance. That's how you walk. Um, 
habitually with him. And then you will certainly not carry out the desires of the sinful nature, which responds impulsively without regard for God and his precepts. And so basically this is saying that we need to make a habit of seeking and responding to the Holy Spirit habitually, meaning regularly, meaning like ideally every day. And if you are a Christian, then you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And that is, that is good news and that is awesome. But we are the ones that still need to be proactive in doing the seeking and the responding. That's, that's on us. And so we're told that being led and guided by the Holy Spirit is what's going to lead us to live life in a God-honouring way, in a way that produces good fruit. And we'll get to that fruit in a minute. And you know, more than ever right now, we need to live our lives. We need to talk, talk and conduct ourselves in a way that glorifies God, that exalts Jesus. And I really love uh, verse 25 as, as it's written in the Amplified because it says this, if we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit. And this is how we walk by the Spirit, with personal integrity, with godly character and with moral courage. Our conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I just, I really love those words and I really love that challenge that the Amplified says. It's, it's about walking the walk, not just talking about it. And so I want to ask church this morning, is our conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit? Is my conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit? And if I was to answer that, I would say, well, sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't, to be really honest. And I'm sure that probably lots of us can, can say a similar thing. And, you know, Paul talked about the two forces um, in Galatians, the two forces that are always fighting each other, the desire of the Holy Spirit in us and then the desire of our sinful nature. And so that's reality for us, is that we have these opposing forces at war within us. But just because that's reality and the situation, the aim that I strive for is that all of my conduct would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. I don't want just some of my conduct to be empowered by the Holy Spirit because it's hard. My aim and standard is that our whole lives and all our conduct is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so my message from this morning really comes out of verse 22, which is the result of God's presence in us. It's the result of being empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's the result of walking habitually with him and seeking him and responding to him. And that result is the fruit of the Spirit. And so let's all say it together. I know Andy said it last week, but let's say it together. Kids, join in. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And you know, the fruit of the Spirit is something that I've been musing on for a while now. My father-in-law loves to teach our, our girls the Bible, and it's really great. And when, back when we used to go and visit them every week, he would sit down with each of my girls separately and he would read a scripture to them and he would ask them to repeat it and then ask them to memorize um, this scripture. And the passage or the scripture that he started back in March teaching them was this exact one, the fruit of the spirit. And so we have been practicing this as a family for a few months now. And in the mornings when I pray with the girls, we go through the fruit of the spirit and we try and we, we remember them. And it's really quite funny listening to kids try and remember scripture. And they, they always miss one. They get like eight out of nine. They always miss a ness, like a kindness or a gentleness or a faithfulness. But they always get love and they always get self-control, the first and the last. And, you know, there's nothing, nothing is ever random in the Bible. Nothing's ever random with God. And so the order of the fruit is actually something that's important for us to know. Love at the start and self-control at the end. And some of you might have heard this before that love and self-control are kind of like the bookends of the fruit of the spirit and they actually hold the other seven fruit in place and that makes sense to me because when you think about it it's out of love all the fruit comes out of love out of love for god and out of the love that we have for each other um, and they all show love because they all characteristics of god and at the other end all of the fruit are held in place by self-control. And again, if you think about it, we need self-control to display and show all of that fruit in our life. You just think about it. Um, you need self-control when you need to be patient and you're in a rush. And you need self-control to show kindness when you really wanna take revenge. And you need self-control to be gentle when you're having a bad day. And you just can think about your own life. Think about your morning even. And I'm sure that we have all 
been and done stuff that we've had to show self-control already before, before lunchtime today. So just think about your morning. Um, maybe you're not even aware that you've been exerting self-control. Maybe for some people, your television or your computer or device that you're streaming this on right now, maybe it wasn't working or maybe the internet was slow. And although you wanted to scream and like throw something at your computer or device, you didn't because you showed self-control because you know that screaming at your computer and TV doesn't actually change anything. Or maybe um, the kids are being a little bit ratty and maybe they're drawing on the walls and making a mess um, instead of, you know, colouring their penguin colouring sheet that Narelle wants them to. Um, but you've got self-control. You haven't yelled at them and you're, you're speaking gently and kind and you're being patient. I know that's what I would be trying to do if I was at home right now. Or maybe, maybe you've had to say no to an extra helping of pancakes or bacon and eggs or chocolate or whatever you eat for breakfast and you've wanted to have that extra helping but you've had self-control and you've said no. It takes self-control to show and live out the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And I'm very aware that for some people right now, it's a season of life where you're frustrated, um, where you're feeling weary, where you're disappointed, and maybe where there's even a bit of anger. And, and we have an opportunity to live differently. We have an opportunity about the kind of fruit that we display in our life. We actually have a choice about that. To, to display fruit to other people uh, in our homes and other people around us, that is the fruit of the sinful nature. And verse 19 talked about hostility and strife and jealousy, fits of anger, disputes, etc. Or the fruit of the spirit. And so this morning, I realize that's a very long introduction, but this morning I wanna talk about one fruit and I would like to talk about peace this morning. So let's talk about peace. Peace is a word that I feel like you hear a lot in church. And as Christians, we use the word a lot and we pray. We pray for peace a lot. And sometimes when you hear a word a lot, it can sometimes lose its significance and its value. And yet right now, peace is something that we need so much of, not just in our own personal lives, but in a bigger sense in our communities and, and in, in a bigger sense all around us. And as Christians, we are called to have peace, to live in peace and to be peaceful with others all of the time, all of the time, including times of turmoil and worry and fear and frustration. And that I realise that doesn't come naturally or easily to everyone all the time. So how do we get peace? How do we have this peace? Well, you know what? It's good news because Jesus tells us in John 14 how to have peace. And he says this in the Amplified. He says, peace I leave with you. My perfect peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And we'll just stop there. And so this is Jesus talking and he's speaking to his disciples and he says that he's going to give us peace twice. And the second time he actually says, my peace. And that's not an insignificant thing that Jesus is actually giving us his own personal peace. That's actually a really significant thing. And so you've got to remember as he's talking to his disciples that his disciples have been with him for the last three years and they have witnessed him do all sorts of things. They have seen him um, face trials and have confrontations with storms and with people and with religious leaders and with demons and with, with Satan himself. And so they've actually seen him deal with all these sort of situations and yet he has remained um, calm He's remained composed and bold. How? How has he been able to do that? Because he's been full of the Holy Spirit. Because he's been empowered by the Holy Spirit. The reason that he could speak peace to the storm is because he was full of peace. And so we've got to understand that this is the kind of peace that he's given us. Jesus has given us his own perfect peace. And it's a gift given to us. And if we, if we go on, the rest of John 14 says this. It says, do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be afraid. And so this next part is actually ours to do, not to let our hearts be troubled or afraid. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who has given us this perfect peace, um, he's done his part. And so in any relationship, it, it takes two parties to make a relationship work. And so Jesus has given us his peace. And so our response to the peace that Jesus has given us, given us is to not let our hearts be troubled or be afraid. And, you know, it's really easy to just say that. Don't be afraid. 
don't be troubled. And some of you might be thinking now, well, that's easy for you to say, Jesus. You know, you're Jesus. You're the son of God. You're perfect. You know, it's easy for you to say that. But I want to encourage us, church, that Jesus would never say something to us that is impossible. He would never ask us to do anything that is impossible. And apart from him and his peace, it is impossible. And he actually says in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. So without Jesus, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible, including not being troubled or afraid in situations that are troublesome or fearful. You know, the enemy works every day to steal our peace. He is a robber. He is a thief. The Bible says that he has come to steal and to destroy. And so if Jesus has given us something, we can know that the enemy is going to want to steal it because it's in his nature to do so. And often he knows how to do that as well. And so it's really, it's really important that we actually know what causes us to lose our peace. And we need to know ourselves and know our triggers because the minute that we start to lose our peace is when emotions start to come in and take over and then we start to make decisions that aren't necessarily good and it goes on from there. And so again, let me ask you church, what causes you to lose your peace? Or maybe how does the enemy steal your peace? Perhaps it's reading the news at the moment or, or listening to the news at the moment. Perhaps it's engaging in in content or conversations online that are negative. And there's a lot of stuff out there at the moment that we can be um, absorbed in, but is listening and being a part of that causing us to lose our peace? Perhaps it's running late. You might be thinking, well, there's not much that we can be running late for right now. I know, like I know we're not going many places, but it's possible to run late online. It is also possible to be running late if you're trying to get to Coles before the curfew to get that ice cream or that chocolate that you want. And I know that this is a big one for me, not like a little bit now, but even more so, this was a big thing for me before lockdown happened. I hate running late. I hate it. I love to be on time. And so the minute that I start to become late is when I start to lose my peace. And so this is a big, a big one for me. What about when someone doesn't do what you have asked them to? Maybe, again, it's kids or it's homework or there's mess or there's dishes that haven't been done. Um, perhaps it's worrying about a situation you can't control. Is it watching your football team lose? Does that cause you to lose peace? I don't know. I don't watch football and I don't, I don't have to worry about that. But I know some guys that I work with, I won't name names, but I suspect, like I suspect, I could be wrong, that when their teams, like when Collingwood and Carlton are losing, I suspect that their peace is just sort of dangling on a thin thread. I don't know. That's what I've heard, but I don't know. Maybe it's something else, but whatever it is, whatever causes you to lose your peace, work it out. Know yourself, know your triggers because the enemy knows them. I actually came across this quote during the week and it said this, it said, the moment something starts costing you your peace, it's too expensive. The moment something starts costing you your peace, it's too expensive. And often the things that cause us to lose our peace, we tend to make room for them in our lives and we actually tend to accommodate them and then we just deal with the fallout. But perhaps that's not actually, perhaps there's another option. Perhaps we need to actually um, minimise the amount of things that steal our peace and perhaps we actually need to get rid of the things that are actually too costly and expensive. Now, I am not for one moment suggesting that people stop watching football. Like I would never suggest that. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we quit our jobs and kids, you don't go to school because you're running late. So let's just get rid of that. My point is, my point is this, is that we need to be careful about how much we accommodate the things that steal our peace. And we need to really guard ourselves and protect ourselves and be aware um, and be on guard. So the rest of verse 27 goes on to say this. So Jesus said, my perfect peace I give you, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he says, let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength for every challenge. And you know, this is the promise that peace gives us. This is the promise. This is how we cannot let our hearts be troubled or afraid. Uh, calms us in every circumstance, every circumstance. Gives us strength 
and courage in every situation. And I don't know if anyone out there needs some calm in their life, or maybe you need some strength and courage for a situation that you're facing right now. But the Prince of Peace can help you. The Prince of Peace can help me. And I, I, did, a, I did a search on scriptures on peace and I found something really interesting. I found that a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of the verses that spoke on peace also mentioned the heart, just like this one in John 14. And so a few chapters later in John 16, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, I've told you these things in verse 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. So in Jesus, we have peace. In the world, you will have trouble, but in him we have peace. And then he says, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So basically, we're going to face trouble, but don't let that trouble creep into your heart. Don't lose heart when you face trouble because in, in Jesus, we have peace. And so we need to take heart. And so I look at this scripture and I look at the others and we'll look at a few in a minute. And it says to me that the existence of peace in our life is actually related to our heart. And peace actually affects the condition of our heart. And I find that really interesting. So I want to just look at a couple more verses. And I want to look at Colossians right now. And Colossians 3.15, it says this. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you are called to peace. And I've got the Amplified verse just to explain it a bit better. It says, let the peace of Christ, and so it explains what the peace of Christ is, the inner calm of one who walks daily with him, be the controlling factor in your hearts, deciding and settling questions that arise. And I I just love the way the Amplified breaks this down. It is in our hearts that we decide and settle on questions and issues that come up in life. And right now, for lots of people, there are lots of questions and there are lots of issues that are coming up. Um, it, it just is, that's the time that we're in. And it's in our heart that we make decisions about those things. It's in our heart that we settle on those things. It's in our heart that we make choices on those things that arise in our life. And so, of course, it makes total sense and it is so essential that peace, that the peace of Jesus rules in the very place where we make decisions and choices. And so another question, ask yourself, what is ruling in your heart right now? Because if peace isn't ruling in our hearts now, then something else is. And often what it can be, and often what's really tempting, is to allow emotions to rule in our hearts instead of peace. And there's nothing wrong with emotions because God created us with emotions and he gave us emotions because we're human beings. And I don't know about you, but I have a lot of emotions. Some people have more emotions than others. I have lots. And so it's, that's fine. But emotions shouldn't be the controlling factor when it comes to making decisions. And that's what this scripture is saying. And again, I realize that we're at a time of life where emotions are high right now and there are a lot of emotions bubbling up in people's lives and we've got to be really careful that we don't allow those emotions to overtake us and you think of a time where you have made a decision based on emotions ruling in your heart instead of peace ruling in your heart and I've got a whole lifetime of examples and scenarios that I could share about but there's one particular story that comes to mind very quickly when I thought of this earlier. Um, I don't know how long ago it was. It was probably 11 or 12 years because it was before Aaron and I were married. Um, We were dating actually at the time. And we went on a mission trip with this church, with LMC, to the Congo in Africa. And I'm pretty sure the only other people that are still at LMC that went on this trip with us are Andy and Cass. And I'm sure Andy and Cass will have a a little giggle at the story. Uh, Andy's nodding right now um, at the story I'm going to tell. Anyway, so this is the last night of our missions trip and we're having like this farewell dinner at the pastor's house, the pastor of the church that we had been um, working with quite closely on the trip. And we were in his backyard and there was quite a, a large gathering of people because there was the whole missions team and then there was the pastor and his family and then not everyone from his church, but quite a few and all Africans love to get involved in a party and when there's food. And it was just, yeah, it was a large gathering of people. And... Um, One of the things about Africa is the bugs and the insects. They just seem to be bigger. They're just amplified over there. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. 
And um, maybe, I don't know, it's hot all the time and so they're always out and no one closes their windows and no one has windows sometimes. And so they're just, they're always in everywhere all the time. They're just amplified. And so anyway, on this, this night of this, this dinner, we were outside and Aaron was on one side of the backyard talking to some people standing under a tree and I was a few metres away. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this creature drop from the tree that he was under and land on his back. And my emotions started to well up and emotions of fear and worry and just sheer panic arose in me and my emotions ruled that evening because I proceeded to scream quite loudly and quite erratically, spider, spider, Aaron, there's a spider on you. I yelled that at him and that's just a, like a snapshot of probably how I reacted at the time. It was probably amplified. If you can imagine that happening, you probably can't. But, but I yelled at him, there's a spider on you in front of all these people, in front of all these church people. And just to put some context around this scenario, um, there had been sightings during the trip in the boys' rooms of spiders. I don't know if it was in Aaron and Phil's room or if it was Andy. Andy reckons it was his room. Okay. So they had captured this spider and even now Andy is like going like this. And Aaron said to me last night, he said the spider was this big Nicole, like so it's an octopus now. So they had seen this like this like gigantic spider with tentacles apparently as legs um, on the wall near their window. And so, it, you know, spiders were on our brain. And then you add to that that Aaron, he doesn't actually like spiders. And Aaron, like he's a manly man and I don't know if there are any other manly men out there who don't like spiders but Aaron he hates spiders and so so that night instead of responding to the situation with peace and like calmness I responded in a crazy way and because I reacted so crazy and emotionally Aaron actually followed my lead and his response to the giant spider that he believed was on his back was to literally rip his shirt off like, and when I say literally rip his shirt off, I actually mean that he tore, he tore his shirt, his favourite shirt, by the way, I found out later, his favourite shirt, he tore it off his back. So what we have now is a scene at, our, at the pastor's house of this white boy running around the backyard shirtless, um, going, like looking for this spider on his back. And it was quite embarrassing for me and him, mainly for him because of me. And... And so that was, that was emotions ruling. And what I should have done, if peace was ruling in my heart that evening, um, then I would have done exactly as my good friend Candice did, and she did this a few moments later, is walk up to Aaron, identify the creature and say, Aaron, there's actually a, a cockroach on your back right now and I'm just going to flick it off for you. End of story. That's what peace would have done. It would have been calm, would have been rational, it would have identified the facts. Now, after this event, this pretty momentous event, Aaron and I had a pretty serious talk, as you can probably imagine, about how I need to learn to be calm uh, and peaceful instead of crazy. And I'm glad I'm, I'm, this story is like, you know, over 10 years old, because I have learnt since then, I believe. I mean, he married me after that, so that says something. But we've never been back to Africa, and we've never seen gigantic spiders that disguise themselves as cockroaches. So we really don't know how I would respond. I'm assuming I would respond much calmer. But Galatians talks about responding impulsively. And that's exactly what we do when emotions rule in our heart. And just like Galatians talks about habitually walking in the spirit, Colossians 2 mentions the daily walk with Jesus. And so it says, let the peace of Christ, the inner calm of one who walks daily with him, and so clearly this is really essential to having peace. We live in peace and we have peace when we are walking every day with Jesus, when we are walking every day being led by the Holy Spirit. When the relationship with Jesus is on the axis on which everything else spins, then it's actually really easy for that fruit of the Spirit to be evident in our life. It actually comes about pretty naturally. And so this, this verse in Colossians actually goes on and talks about that as members of one body, we are called to be peaceful. It says, to this peace, indeed, you are called as members in one body of believers and be thankful to God always. And so there's another aspect of peace here, and that is that we are called to be promoters of peace with other people. 
Um, and you know, that, that doesn't mean just to be peaceful with other people, doesn't mean that we always agree. Like, let's just get that straight. You don't always have to agree to be peaceful. It is possible to disagree and still do so in a peaceful way. And, you know, disagreeing with the absence of peace is exactly what the world does. It's exactly what the world does. And so we've got to be different. We've got to be different. We need to show and promote peace with other people, with our friends and even with our enemies. You know, Romans says this in, in 12 verse 18. It says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Other versions say, as far as it depends on you or do whatever it takes to live in peace with everyone. We are called to be peaceful. And, you know, we are not going to be able to show peace and, and promote peace with other people if we don't have peace within ourselves. And that's why peace needs to rule in our heart. It's out of peace ruling in our heart that we are able to be peaceful with other people. So that's Colossians. I've got one more verse that I would love to finish with, and that's in Philippians 4 verse 7. And Paul says this, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so the context of this is that Paul has been talking about uh, not being anxious and presenting our requests with thanksgiving to God. And then he says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts. And so here we see that peace acts as a protection. And when we live life without peace, it actually, it leaves us vulnerable. It leaves us vulnerable to all sorts of things, emotions like you heard in my story. Um, and in this particular context leaves us vulnerable to worry and so peace is really important it's a shield for our heart and you know we're told in Romans I'm sorry we're told in Proverbs uh, above all else guard your heart for all the issues of life flow from it flow from it and so it's important to guard our hearts we've got to guard our hearts and one way that we can guard our hearts is peace I um I shared just this week my testimony with our Connect group. And some of you would have heard parts of it before. And um, for those that know me well, uh, and based on the story that I told earlier, you, you know that I'm not a calm person by nature. Like people don't describe me as, oh, Nicole, she's that really chilled girl. Like that's never been, I've never been described as chilled ever before in my life. Um, but, you know, I still remember six years ago, uh, very vividly at one of the scariest and one of the most fearful times in my life, hobbling along a hospital corridor at 3 a.m. in the morning after having a really major operation and that day being given a cancer diagnosis and a very grim outlook for life and having nothing but peace in my heart. For someone like me in a situation like that, my heart should have been it should have been troubled. It should have been afraid, but it wasn't. I had nothing but peace in my heart. Unexplainable, transcending all understanding kind of peace. Uh, and it guarded my heart. That peace guarded my heart for the journey that was to come. Because down the track in a few weeks, or in a few months time, when all sorts of emotions would be threatening to rule my heart, emotions that weren't actually gonna help me, I would remember that peace. I would look back on that night and remember that, that tangible peace that was so strong, that was only from God, that was only from the Prince of Peace and it would get me through. It would bring me calm and it would actually help me to, 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 to live out the next year, 18 months of my life. Peace is not just a nice Christian word. It's not just a nice churchy kind of word that we say for no reason. The peace of God is real. The peace of Jesus is real. It has been given to us as a gift and we need it. We need it right now. We need to have our hearts guarded right now. We need to have um, the fruit of the Holy Spirit living and operating in us. We need to be promoters of peace with other people. We need to have peace ruling our hearts instead of emotions right now. And I just want to go back to Galatians uh, and back to a few of the verses that I read at the start. I want to finish as I read them again. Verse 16 says, Walk habitually in the Holy Spirit. Seek him and be responsive to his guidance. The fruit 
of the, sorry, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And verse 25, if we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit with personal integrity, godly character, moral courage, our conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Church, let's pray um, as we close this message. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much that it teaches us to live in freedom. And I thank you so much that you have given us the Holy Spirit to enable us to live our lives in the freedom and the fullness that you want us to. And, and Father, I pray that, that you would give every person that is watching right now a hunger and a desire for more of your spirit in their life, to, to seek and to respond to the Holy Spirit in our lives like never before. Father, that our conduct would be empowered by your spirit. And God, I, I do pray right now, I ask for your amazing peace to be with every person, with every, with every family, with every person that is watching right now. I ask for that peace that brings calm to people. I ask for the peace that actually gives us strength and courage right now. I ask for peace to rule in our hearts right now. And I, I pray that it would, it would guard us, that it would protect us, that it would allow us to, to be a point of difference in our community, uh, in our spheres of influence right now. And Father, I thank you so much that you make a difference to our lives. And God, I pray that as we, as we just reflect on your word and, and the life that you give us, that you would make a difference in our lives. And I pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen, church. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, I'm going to pass back over to Andy now. Thanks, Andy. <laughs>